it is so okay to rethink your Christian spirituality. It is. It is okay to let go of certain beliefs and certain doctrines that no longer express your true heart. A heart that wants to continue to love more, love in greater ways. A heart that wants to include more in greater ways. A heart that wants to evolve more and experience more. So it is quite okay to rethink your Christian spirituality. You know, for me, uh, my Christian faith is not believing something and that something is expressed in certain dogmas or certain specific doctrines or somebody's version of that and then calling that faith as if mere beliefs in something are what create an alive spiritual life. No, for me what creates an alive spiritual life is a relational, reliant trust in someone. It's an intimate connection to God, to Christ. And this is what makes God alive in my mind, my body, my soul. So it is so okay for you to want to rethink it all. It's so okay for you to shift away from certain beliefs that you no longer uh, can have. You, you can do that. And you know, didn't didn't Jesus model to us just that? Didn't he model to us rethinking and reimagining the whole thing? Didn't Jesus confront those who said, you know, our version of the Bible, our perspective of it is the correct one and yours isn't it? Didn't he confront them all the time and then turn to the people and say to them, you have heard it said, referring to their version of it. You have heard it said, and then he goes, but I say to you, and then Jesus shifted the whole thing to a greater love, a greater inclusion of more and more and more. And when you look at the life of the Apostle Paul, didn't Paul demonstrate the same thing? Wasn't Paul, his former life, wasn't he part of a system, a belief system that said our belief system is the right system, our version of the Bible, interpretation of it is right, and yours isn't? Didn't Paul then shift from all of that? And his whole life was then about reimagining, rethinking the whole thing? Didn't the Apostle Paul eventually have a serious argument with the Apostle John over just that? John who wanted to hold on to all the old ways and not budge from them because of his fear or maybe his fear of being wrong. Didn't Peter have to actually put to sleep all the old ways and he had to end up dreaming up something that he never could have imagined. And then Peter woke up and then ended up demonstrating and living a life that proved he rethought and reimagined the whole thing. Peter was the forerunner to the Christian church. So it's okay to rethink your faith. Don't worry about those that tell you you can't. And remember the words of the Apostle John, the one who wanted to hold the old ways and then woke up. Remember his words towards the end of his life. And he said this, God is love. And those who love are in God. So welcome to Sparrow Day a place that is reimagining, rethinking Christian spirituality, and a place where your story finds a home.
Okay, I am in week two of this series I'm doing calling Hearing Your Sacred Voice. And last week I spoke about trusting that inner voice. This week I want to talk about actually listening to that inner voice, being able to hear it. And then next week what I'm going to talk about is what happens when that inner voice gets wonky. And I'll talk about recognizing that. But I thought what we could start out with is just beginning to get centered. So wherever you're watching this, uh, if you can just still your body, your mind, take a couple deep breaths in, let it out slowly. As you breathe in, breathe something you're hoping for. As you breathe out, fall deeper into your chair or into your setting. Breathe out something you want to let go. And for a moment now, just be still. Just be here. Now with that inner voice, in your own way, converse with God. Tell God how you feel, what you need, and relationally attach to God. God, awaken us, that inner voice that is inhabited by your spirit, you living within us. Help us to hear and listen and to trust. And I pray this in Jesus' name.
Okay, so if last week was about trusting our inner voice, this week is about actually listening, being able to hear, recognizing our inner voice. Now, a number of you have mentioned to me in the last couple weeks that when you saw the titles spiritually, they're really resonating with you, trusting your inner voice, listening to your inner voice. But others of you have also mentioned to me that there was an initial jolt in reading those verses. Why? Because if you especially come from a very uh, conservative Christian background, uh, you weren't taught well or trained well to trust your inner voice. In fact, you were taught not to trust yourself. You were taught to deny yourself, and you are only to trust God and trust his word, as if the two cannot go together. You kind of this created straw man where you have to pick one or the other. And I just don't think the New Testament teaches that. That is not my experience of that. I believe that when you actually have a mature trusting in God, it results in a mature trusting in yourself. The two go hand in hand. And so I hope I can clear this up a little bit as we look at a story from the Gospel of John. And uh, I just want to say this at Sparrow Day when we open up the scriptures. We really aim to have a, uh, a higher religious literacy when it comes to looking at the scriptures versus just saying God says this, God teaches that. We love looking at the cultural context, the historic context, especially as it relates to our evolving way of life that we're currently in. And so I want to show you this story uh, from the Gospel of John. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, the Gospel of John comes very early in the New Testament. It's actually the fourth book of the New Testament. And so you would think that, well, if it comes that early, it must have been written earlier. And that's not the case. Uh, though the New Testament has an order and has a canon, uh, the books are not put in chronicle, uh, chronological order by date. So even though the Gospel of John comes early, it's one of the last books written um, in, in New Testament and in church history. In fact, most scholars think the book was written anywhere from 90 CE all the way to 110 into the first century. CE. So Christianity, when this book was written, Christianity was already anywhere from 60 to 70 to 80 to 90 years old. So the Gospel of John, certainly giving a perspective of Jesus' life, it's giving a perspective of Jesus' life from a vantage point of Christianity already being 75, 80 years old. And so that's how they're looking back at the past through the vantage point of it almost turning into the second century. Now, the Gospel of John is very different than the other three Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I won't explain all of those differences other than those are called the Synoptic Gospels. The Gospel of John is considered something uh, quite different more symbolism, more metaphor. It's where Jesus says his famous I am's. So I want to share with you this story from uh, John 14. And let me set this up for you. When this story takes place in John 14, it is not a happy day for the apostles, the disciples who are following Jesus. It is starting to hit them that this little road they've had, this show they've had on the road with Jesus for these last three years, it looks like it's about to be over. All this time, they had believed that Jesus was going to be an earthly king, run the Romans out of their occupation, and actually be an earthly king who kind of leads their, uh, their Jewish and religious way, their spiritual way of life as an earthly king. Now it's hitting them what Jesus has been teaching them, which is Jesus has been talking about a kingdom that is not of this earth, and that his ways are spiritual and beyond this earth. And so they are very discouraged because the voice that they have depended on, the life they have physically been with, 
is no longer going to be with them and they are overwhelmed they are frightened and they are discouraged and then this is what jesus teaches them jesus said to his disciples don't be worried have trust in god and have trust in me there are many rooms in my father's house i wouldn't tell you this unless it was so I'm going there to prepare a place for each of you. So this is where Jesus is, is referring metaphorically to his death, and they are getting the picture. Thomas said, Lord, we don't even know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus answered. Without me, no one can go to the Father. Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, show it by living what I've taught you. Then I will ask the Father to send you the Holy Spirit, who will help you and always be with you. The Spirit leads you into all truth. The people of this world cannot accept the Spirit because they don't see or know him. But you know him because he lives in you. Okay, so let me explain some key things from this verse that it's very important to understand that some of the things I'm about to share with you are from our earliest Christian understanding. And when we understand they are part of our earliest Christian tradition, it's actually going to help us be able to listen and to hear our inner voice today. So Jesus teaches seven famous I am's in the Gospel of John. And in verse six, we see one of them. It's when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now this phrase, I am the way, was a well-known phrase in Jewish wisdom literature. The word he uses there is hadas. And for any Jew that was very familiar with Jewish synagogal teaching, this phrase was well known. And this phrase, though, does not denote a direction. It does not denote a route moving from one place to another. And you might think it would, <clears throat> especially based on Thomas's question before, which is, where are you going? But when Jesus uses this well-known phrase that people understood, hadas, what this phrase means is it means connection to God. It means unity to God. Jesus is saying, I am the unity with God. I am the connection to God. This is not a word about direction. And when our spiritual faith, when our Christian spirituality is about certain creeds, keeping certain doctrines, when it's defined by you have to hold certain beliefs, these are all words about, these are all ways of direction. The way you live the Christian life is by following this certain direction. When Jesus uses this word, the way, hadas, he is using a word of connection. He's saying, I am the connection to God. That's what I am. And then he says something interesting right after. He says, I am the truth. Now, the Greek word there is aletheia. This word aletheia does not mean a specific truth. He's not, or a specific doctrinal belief. Jesus isn't saying, I am a specific doctrinal belief that we're going to call the truth that you have to believe. He's not saying, I am that. This word aletheia doesn't mean that at, at all. This word aletheia means what is actually true in all matters. It's actually Jesus is saying, I am what's actually true. I am what's actually true. It's not about a specific belief. So when Christian spirituality, when the Christian faith, um, is about a certain doctrinal direction and then um, 
calling that truth, it moves us away from real connection. Um, when Jesus says, I am the way, he is talking about an intimate connection that you lead. And then that is what's actually true. That is a big difference. So at Sparrow Day, I like to say true is better than truth. Because truth can be a triggering word. Some of you have left somebody's version of the truth. You go, I don't buy it anymore. In fact, as you've left it and your heart has opened up and evolved spiritually, you go, I am now experiencing what is actually true. I am experiencing something in my inner being, my inner voice as true. And so this is what Jesus means. And it, it makes what he said in John chapter 8, six chapters earlier, make all the more sense. Look at this. So Jesus said to the people who trusted in him, if you continue to journey in my teaching, you are really my followers. You will know the truth, there's the word aletheia, and the truth, there's the word aletheia, will set you free. Same word, same meaning. Jesus is saying through relational trust, this is how you connect with what is actually true, Christ. When you keep Jesus' teachings, this is what shows your, he's meaningful to you and you follow him. So then let's look at what Jesus is saying two chapters later in John 16. But he, the spirit of truth, there's that word Alethe again, has come. He will guide you into all truth, all aletheia. So again, this is a very forward-looking trueness. Jesus will guide us in, his spirit will guide us into what's true. So let me talk about some growing ways that we can begin to actually listen to our inner voice and hear our inner voice. And I'll share two with you. The first one is to embrace the intuitive mystery of all, it all. Embrace it. Embrace it. It's intuitive. And yes, embrace that it is mysterious. Look, let me show you what Paul says about this in 1 Corinthians. But the person who is joined to the Spirit becomes, sorry, but the person but the person who is joined to the Lord becomes spiritually one with him. Oh man, let's not skip over that. He just said that when we join ourselves with God, God is actually living in us and we become one with him. I can't explain that. I don't understand that. That is all out mysterious. But even though I can't explain it, I can more and more embrace it so that I more and more experience it. And so this is a practice. And so listen in quieter moments. And the reality is some of you have understood this without even understanding it. You know when you have felt some, an impression um, an impulse, a leading of some way, uh, a sense of something. You know what it's like to follow that. You even know what it's like to sense that and have a certain impression and then to go, nah, nah, and turn away from it. Only to go, oh man, I should have followed that impression. You know what that's like. So, this is an amazing, mysterious thing he's just saying, that God's spirit lives within us. Jesus taught that. And when we are connected to God, it leads and guides us. Again, mysterious, call it what you want. Spirit-filled, spirit-led, inner voice, sacred voice, it doesn't matter. But it's in our Christian tradition, our Christian spirituality, this is what it teaches. And um, I wouldn't, um, it doesn't come through an audible voice. I've never heard 
an audible voice, though I imagine maybe somebody could or say they do. Uh, I've never heard an audible voice. It comes through as I am intimate, intimately connected to God and I am well aware it just melds very naturally with my impressions, my impulses, uh, my senses of awareness and my uh, discernment. It just, it really works quite natural with that. That's why I, what I would say is don't over-spiritualize this. Don't hyper-supernaturalize this. It's just a very natural thing that as God is living in us, the Spirit is just naturally guiding us through ourselves. Is it me? Yes. Is it God? I think so. They go hand in hand, and I don't have to over-spiritualize it and over-supernaturalize it. It's just, it is me. Trusting me is connected to God. Trusting God means that I'm also connected uh, to me. In fact, when the Hebrew scriptures speak of this kind of leading or the voice of God to us, it says it doesn't come with a bang, it doesn't come with a quake, it comes in a whisper. It's a whisper. And what does whisper remind you of? Whisper is a very breathy voice. In the Greek New Testament, when, we're t when we talk about the spirit living in us, the word for spirit is breath. It is breath. So it's just something very natural, like a whisper, like breathing, uh, that just leads us. And it is like a muscle we work. When we're more uh, connected to God, we hear better. The more we listen and then move and risk and trust that, the more we voice um, what we're trusting and who we are, it just makes that muscle of listening and hearing and trusting all, all the stronger. And so it's very empowering when that whisper, that breath, that impression comes. It doesn't have to muster something up. It doesn't have to uh, try real hard. It's just very free flowing and empowering. And when those impressions and that inner voice comes and you're listening to it, it always leads you to your true self. And whenever you're being led to your true self, this always creates freedom. It never leads you to somebody's version of yourself. Somebody, it never leads you to a false version of yourself. It always leads you to a free, truer version of yourself. And I know what I'm saying. Those of you especially who have had strong American evangelicalism, you have a strong uh, biblicism and literalism and biblical absolutism. I know this is uh, maybe hard because we've been so trained to actually detach for, from ourselves, do not trust ourselves, and actually move to a form of rationalism. So when the Bible has an answer for everything, when the Bible is infallible and inerrant, you know, when it says, when we think that it just fell from heaven, and um, uh, what it, it, no wonder people end up uh, being drawn to literalism and fundamentalism and absolutism and biblicism because you don't have to hold mystery. You don't have to navigate risk in trusting yourself and that God's spirit's in. All you have to do is have an external belief in something. I'm not saying that's easy either, but what I am saying is, uh, when Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, he's saying the way and the truth is about an intimate, reliant connection to God, not a specific direction. So, um, and it's not about rationalism. It's very mysterious. And as we embrace that um, and listen to it, 
it begins to grow stronger. Okay, let me give you the second and last thing of how we can better listen, how we can better hear. You begin to practice new listening patterns. And so as you begin to work that uh, listening hearing muscle uh, and try out some new patterns, you'll grow it. So let me give you uh, four real quick. One of them is create some time. Be, be very intentional about creating uh, silence around you, about stilling yourself and creating listening times. Listen, it's busy out there. The world is busy out there. I am a seven uh, on the Enneagram with a seven wing. Uh, so actually listening uh, is difficult for me. No, actually I'm a seven with an eight wing, which still makes listening difficult for me. I want to go. I'm drawn to having answers. I'm drawn to getting stuck all up in my head and having reasons for everything. I have to really navigate my life uh, to be still. But when I'm still, when I'm mindful and meditative, when I'm prayerful, when I'm quiet, when I'm s still, that's when the whisper, that's where the breath comes. So I would be very intentional about creating some sacred space. The second thing I would do is very much attune to your emotions. Get your noticer out on your emotions. Listen, when we talk about listening to your inner voice, for some people it doesn't come in a sense of an impression or an Im impulse or an inner dialogue. It is actually through their emotions that they hear. And all of us would do well to listen more to our emotions. What are the signposts our feelings are telling us? This, is, this actually helps you not to be emotionally reactive, but to be authentically, emotionally responsive in healthy ways by pausing and going, what am I feeling? They might be directing you in certain ways. So attuned to your emotions. Uh, the third thing I'll say is look for your inner voice patterns. And so whether you realize it or not, you have a history of you. And so there might be certain ways uh, that you operate in certain patterns that when you become more aware of them, you go, oh, that's how I hear. That's how I listen. So obviously uh, setting intentional time to listen only helps you with that. And just like getting a, uh, to know a new pattern or it's like a new relationship. When you get to know a new relationship, you might be drawn to it, uh, to them and attracted to them, but it's going to take time with them to know them. Same thing. So as you develop new patterns, as you take time, you'll get to know them better. And then the last thing I want to share with you is the way you hear, the way you listen, is it is a balance between your mind, your heart, and your soul. Your mind is your thoughts, but it's also the things that get trapped in your thoughts. It could be your ambitions, of course, but it could also be your your anxieties, your fears, your avoidance, your reactions, okay? So it's a balance of things in our mind. It's a balance of things, our heart. What I'll call our heart is what I was referring to before, the way, the truth. This is our trueness. This is our, our being, being who we actually are. And then our soul is that connection uh, to God. It is that reliant trust in God. In hearing uh, our inner voice, that sacred voice, it is a balance of all of these. Some people get so weighted up in their minds. They get so weighted in their heads. Some people get so uh, trapped in their heart uh, and feeling everything. Some people get hyper-spiritual. Um, ridiculously supernatural. Um, it's a balance of all of these things so things don't get trapped anywhere, but they all work simpatico and work uh, with harmony. And this is something that takes 
time, it takes awareness, it takes uh, stillness. So these are four things that you can begin to practice. But the center of what I've been sharing with you is not this teaching. The center of what I'm sharing with you is about what we're about to do now. And it's to go into a sacred time of attunement, of awakening, and um, of action. Just begin to still your mind, your heart, your body. And just let my voice and the slides guide you into this prayerful and meditative time. the time of attunement, just begin to attune your heart to God. Begin to attune that relational trust in God. As we move into a time of awakening, just begin to notice what do you need to face or admit? What do you need to let go of? What do you need to move towards? What do you need to awaken to? What is awakening in you? And then finally, let's move to a time of action. How can you give action to what you're awakening to? What you're becoming aware of? God, we look to the origins of our Christian tradition. And that is part of Christian spirituality is the spirit of God lives within us. And that the way, the truth, the life is about a deeper connection to you. And as we are more connected to you, that is the way, as we are more connected to you, you will guide us and lead us into what's actually true in all matters. I pray for my friends listening. They and their hearts and their inner voice is the best arbiter for your trueness in them. It's not my teaching. It's not some version of Christianity. You have given us the spirit you have given us the ability to reliantly connect to you. And you will lead us and guide us in that connection and intimacy and into trueness. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>